run. It's a very sad day. We're all extremely depressed. I can't believe I have to be the one to tell you this. It looks like the World Cup Series will not be returning to Fort William next year. I mean, they have said this for the last five years, so we will have to wait and see. My name is Ben Cathro. This is Pink Bikes Inside the Tape here in Fort William for the 2023 World Championships. As it might be the final time we race here, the organizers have put some extra effort into the track this year. They've flown in a few metric tons of gravel to fill in the holes, build some berms, and they've taped in a handful of fresh lines to make the first major changes that we've seen in a while. It's made things a bit tamer than we've seen in the past, but riders are thoroughly enjoying the changes. <laughs> The track in Fort William is long with a mellow gradient and a high average speed. It's mostly man-made with local quarried, sandy dirt, rock and gravel which provides a riding surface unlike any other track in the world. It's one of the few tracks that has sections that actually get grippier when it's wet, which is fortunate given where we are. The moisture binds the dust, sand and coarse gravel together into pure grip. It does have some more traditional sections in the woods with soil that definitely can be described as slippy when wet. Add this all up and you've got a fast and varied track that rewards corner speed and flow. We are missing a few key bicycle riders this weekend, which is a real shame. After winning his first ever Elite World Cup in Italy, Jackson Goldstone made the decision to get his problem appendix removed as it had been bothering him with infections all season. Unfortunately, he's had some post-surgery complications. It's meant he can't eat properly, he's lost a load of weight, and his body is not up to racing this weekend. So he's gonna take some time out, let his body figure it out. Keeping things within the syndicate, Laurie Greenland and Nina Hoffman won the national race here in Fort William by convincing margins earlier in the season. I would have picked both of them for the wins this weekend, but both are riding with injured knees that are holding them back to varying degrees. We've also just heard that Nina has smacked her dome and may be out of the race with a concussion. The rider second in the World Cup series is carrying an injury from the Crankworx downhill race in Whistler. Finn Isles seeded first at that event, then crashed in practice and retired from the event before race runs. Word is he injured his hand and wrist, but he is here and racing in Fort William and looking fast. At the same race in Whistler, junior rider Dane Dewitt for our Pivot Factory Racing over there, lit up the hillside and scored the fastest time overall. No doubt this will be a confidence booster coming into champs and he will be one to watch. He'll have to battle against a flat out trio of Christian Hauser, who looks to be back to full strength, Ryan Pinkerton, who once again is lighting things up in practice, and series leader Bodhi Kuhn, who can never be counted out. Scotland's only elite downhill world champion, Reese Wilson, unfortunately did not recover from his leg explosion in the off season to a level that selection for world champs was on the cards. I know in his eyes, he would be able to be competitive, but with so many fast UK racers to select from, the GB team had to go by the selection criteria and pick riders who actually had some results this season. Gutting for the lad, given it'll probably be the last ever home world championships. Talking of British riders, there are quite a few potentials for medals here this weekend. Bernard Kerr has been heard saying that he will happily risk his life this weekend, and I do not doubt him. Danny Hart has been finding pace again and goes well here, as does Matt Walker on his prototype Saracen, and Charlie Hatton has not been hanging about on his UK-made Atherton bike. But eyes will be on first-year elite, Jordan Williams to see if he can take some rainbow stripes at his first Elite World Championships. It's definitely possible. I was really happy to see Rachel Atherton was signed up for racing after she sat out the last race due to fatigue. She's definitely a strong contender for the win despite not being in peak physical condition. But the chat on the hill is that she crashed on her second run and has dislocated her shoulder. And we did see her in a sling just a second ago. And I am gutted that she is not going to be able to compete. I hope the injury isn't too bad. The final Brit chat that I have for you is Pink Bike's own Amy Kenyon. This is her home race and she is looking excellent on track. She has never won a world level race in junior, but it would be pretty epic if she did it at this one. She'll have to battle against the winner of the last World Cup, Sasha Ernest, who has serious pace as a first year junior. Lisa Bouladou won the national here by a healthy margin earlier in the year and will also be a very strong contender. Obviously, teammates Amory Pierron and Miriam Nicole are still out of action, but Thibaut Duprella is flying the flag for Commensal Muckoff and after his podium at the last race and his second place result here last year, he is a solid pick for the win this weekend. 
With Miriam missing in action, Rachel out, and Nina possibly seeing stars, it looks to be a battle between Cami Belanche racing for Switzerland and Valley Hull representing Austria for the rainbow stripes this weekend. There are some curveballs I'd like to add to the mix though. Gracie Hemstreet was on race winning pace at the last round before crashing and should not be overlooked. Also, Phoebe Gale has been figuring things out and showing pace which could transfer to something magical at our home race. Finally, keep an eye out for Harriet Harnden, who is a cyclocross turned cross country, turned enduro, turned downhill racer, who is chasing gravity fed medals for Trek Factory Racing. While there are other elite men on for a good result this weekend, all eyes are on the king of champs, Lloyd Bruni. He has the uncanny ability to get all the pieces in place for world champs and raise his game when it counts. He is already looking determined and quick on track and will no doubt have the most well put together plan to get the win this weekend. Let's pop over to Ben in the studio so he can fumble his way through an analysis of the Tricky Woods section. Thank you, Ben. We are in the outdoor studio today and joining me this evening uh, are the midges. I'll try not to get too bothered by them. So we are on board with Amy Kenyon, second in qualifying in the junior category today. And she is in the wood section, which is one of the trickiest parts of the track. It's got slippy mud, there's roots, there's rocks, there's trees. There's a lot going on in here. There's also some line choice. So let's follow her down this section. She's coming off a drop, big compressions, big holes into a high line and down into this next section where our first lines begin. If you have a look here, you can see the main line most people are doing is going here, around these rocks, and into the wood section. The eagle-eyed among you can tell there is a straighter line you can do, and you can see the tire marks of where a few people have done it. So if you head straight, hit this compression, squish the suspension and pull up from here, you can actually jump and skim over those rocks and then head down into the next section. Very committing line, very tricky to do, but when you get it fast, looks pretty cool. So let's head down a little bit further. So Amy goes round the rock, steers it in, and you can see there's a lot of real estate here to play with. Most people have been doing this line here. They're going around here, right hand side of the red pad and down into the next section. The other main obvious line that people were doing are going all the way around the outside, below the red pad and then down into the next section. but you can see tire marks are everywhere. People are coming down here, people are going down there, and then getting into the lower line on the next bit. And what people are trying to do when they're taking all these different lines is they're trying to find clean, smooth ground where they have traction and where they can do their slowing down before this corner. Because if there's lots of roots and holes and things going on, breaking on that, it's really tricky. So they're trying to find clean dirt and the track just kind of gets wider and wider and wider. And then it all just turns into a big mess. Maybe a bit more speed, eh? Jesus. Get the headgear on. Because we're diving in, folks. We're diving into this corner. Let's go. So Amy has chosen to do this lower line around the bottom of the tree. You can see there's a few steps. There's a couple little roots, but nothing too major. And she's finding it really consistent. She can carry her speed around. But it is a tighter turn onto the big step down off the road. She reckons it's a better line for her. You can see another line though that goes from the higher line diagonally down to this low line and then you have to turn tight at that compression there and then join onto that same lower line which looks Terrible, like how that corner must be so tight, but you can come into it so fast. You can go really direct. You don't have to mess about setting up or anything like that. And then you, you've got like a nice compression where it joins back on, where you go off the step that you can dig in and then head straight into that next feature.
it's a funny one. It doesn't look like it's going to be good, but it is working really well for some people. And the reason they're doing that and not the High Line is the High Line has got loads of big rocks and roots. You can try and go above them, but it's super slippy and hard to do. You can try going below them, but you're going to slip and have a bad time. It is possible to get through it cleanly, but some people are ending up way down here. And if you're down there, it is very tricky to carry the speed into that next section. It's a very, very difficult bit to get clean and fast. You can see her coming round, round this pad, off the brakes, flow off this step down. So you can see exit speed out of this section is not critical because you are going fast and braking into this corner. It's all about carrying the speed through that wood section, getting it clean, keeping your feet on because you do not want to clip out and end up going off of this drop with your feet off. Oh, and that is the tricky wood section here in Fort William. We're going to ghost it and see who did it best. Let's check that out. So let's kick things off with Troy Brosnan. He's all the way to the outside, fully low, carrying the speed and off the drop. And now we've got Greg Williamson doing a line nobody thought was even possible, fully inside to the low. So let's compare the two of them as Brooke watches on. And here they go. So we got Troy, he's on that outside and Greg is on the much shorter line. Look how direct it is. He's going to arrive at this turn well before Brosnan, but he's got the much tighter exit. There's a good compression there where you can dig in. And look at the speed Brosnan's got, he's catching him up. Greg sticks a pedal stroke in, but I don't think it's going to do it for him. Troy overtakes him off the edge. And look at that, that is 0.18. So the shortest isn't working yet. And now we've got Jordan Williams. This is the man that I was picking for the win, but it doesn't look good so far after qualifying and he is on the wide line. Now, on the other line, Bernard Kerr, the man that said he will happily risk his life. And look at him risking his life on that high line. He gapped over the stump and it looked clean. So, we got Bernard heading on to that high line. It's a lot more delicate. There's a lot more routes there. It's very tricky to do as Jordan carries speed around the outside. And it's looking neck and neck as they come around. Bernard is in the air, but Jordan is carrying more speed. Bernard has the more direct exit. And look at that. Bernard's in the lead on the Ferrari paint job and he gets to the end. Look at that, 0.3 seconds to Bernard. So we've got Troy again in that low line. He actually did this low line the fastest. And we're going to compare him to your man, Bernard Kerr. Sports fans, who's going to take it? Bernard is on that high line. He's making it look clean. But let's compare. So now we've got them. Troy on the white. Bernard on that high line. Who is going to get it the cleanest? Who is going to take the win? You can see... Troy is carrying the speed around that wide line. That gap from Bernard, it's so difficult to do, but he makes it happen. He's off the brakes. You can see the acceleration. It is a decimation. Look at this. BK takes it by 0.27. So it looks like if you get that high line clean, it is the fastest through this section. Well, I would never would have guessed it. It was Bruni, wasn't it? Knew it. <laughs> Back to Ben in a, the pits. Thanks for that, Ben. Really insightful. I especially like the way you drew them. Lines really squiggly this time. It was good. And that's it from Pink Bike and me here in Fort William. The cowbells are out, the kilts are on, the fans are arriving. It's gonna be a big race this weekend. Can't wait to see it. I have no idea who's gonna win. If you think you know who's gonna win, let us know in the comments. And stay tuned for Story of the Race, which will be out very soon. We'll see you then. Perfect. In a bit. Signing out.